Mini episode 459 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by TV Howl, your home on the web for coverage of today's television scene and a look at the history of the medium as covered by big time TV critic Adam Buckman. Follow them on the web at tvhowl.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Okay, everyone, it's the FDH Lounge. Rick Morris and Kyle Ross talking that good old NFL football. Today we are talking the NFC. We're previewing 2014, our third pass-through on this that we've done looking at the NFL. We're looking at the NFC, the best and the worst teams in the NFC, the elite teams and the teams that Kyle Ross has deemed will not make the playoffs in 2014. So we'll be taking all these together. For anybody that would like to go back and check out what we said previously, because this is, again, we're just putting the cherry on the sun. We've already covered the NFC. We covered the NFC East in mini-episode 399, the North in 403, the South in 406, and the West in 413. Additionally, we took a look at NFL win totals in episode mini-episodes 441, 442, and 443. So we've covered a lot of this. It's just what we think since we last convened on this at the beginning and of the And you thought ESPN camp. milked that cow for all it's worth. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yes. <laughs> yes. We're doing it. Hey, we're giving the people what they want. Uh, Football is yes. one of our most popular things to cover. Yes. And by the way, this new setup you have here in the uh, Foss studio has a real crossfire feel to it. The yes. late 90s Bill Press fee Pat Buchanan <laughs> situation here we, going on. We are embracing debate today. Yes. No well, question about that. Although if you that. walk in, I'm sitting on the right, which doesn't make sense if, you, if one were to walk in that would exactly make sense. should we yeah. switch seats before that would we do confuse this people uh that would be a little bit tough logistically here during the broadcast so we'll, okay we'll just go with it i didn't want to get up is. anyway yeah <laughs> neither one of us really wants to do that <laughs> no. we're uh, we're settled in here we're ready to talk nfc we got the elite teams and when you're talking about the elite teams in the nfc we got four teams we're going to talk about but we'll start with the two that are the best of the best the two that essentially in retrospect played the real super bowl in the nfc championship game seattle and san francisco the teams that again i think most people myself included would call one and two in the league coming into this season yes i have them one and two coming mm-hmm. here in my power rankings interesting that i think san francisco as i take a dramatic pause there <laughs> but i think san francisco might have a slightly worse regular season than you think okay you got some suspensions to deal with now alden smith that's one, I suppose, not some. But the injury to Bowman as well, that defense. You're some lumping holes. these things together because it doesn't matter why they're out as long as they are out. Yes, but but, but yeah. th- that's some key personnel that's yes. out. New stadium. Statistics show that teams playing the first year in their new home stadium tend to sh- surprisingly struggle, okay. especially early. Okay. So a team that's been to three consecutive conference championship games, including one Super Bowl, San Francisco's kind of in that position right now where all that matters is getting it done in the playoffs. Yes. I think to them, compared to some of these other teams we're going to talk about here in the next couple of minutes, home field advantage doesn't matter as much. It matters only in the sense that they obviously don't want to go to the Seattles, the Green Bays, the New Orleans. All Those three teams all right. uh, hold tremendous home field advantages, particularly Seattle and New Orleans. But with San Francisco, I just think that maybe they're going to win a less games than you think okay that said i think they're very dangerous in the playoffs okay you know when we will obviously be talking nfl on a week-to-week basis and when mm-hmm. it comes to playoff time this is a team that i would not want to face at all but i'm going to say san francisco only 10 wins okay seattle team that i gave you at the begin- at this time last year to win the super bowl they did they're my favorite again this year i'm going to say 12 wins for them they get the they get the top seed mm-hmm. again a- Again, here's the thing with Seattle. Will their defense be as good as last year? Probably not, since it was historically great. Mm-hmm. We've seen that. We talked about that last year with Adrian Peterson. He was going to have a drop. You can't. It's very difficult to repeat a historically great season. Well, and according to the great uh, Bill Barnwell at Grantland, very possibly the best secondary of all time based on how they performed last year. They might have been. People don't know this. Richard Sherman may be the second best player in that secondary behind Earl Thomas. Sure. Yeah, I can believe that. So, Maybe third behind Cam Chancellor. The three of them are pretty tight. Yeah. You know, one, two, three. Yes. I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah. 
So Seattle, I've got as my number one at 12 and four. The thing is, they're just not going to lose very much at home. No, maybe they lost one time last year. Mm -hmm. They didn't lose at all at home the year before. So maybe they lose one again and go five and three on the road. Mm -hmm. That's 12 and four. Uh, San Francisco, I have 10 and six. And the other buy, obviously, you know, only one of those teams can get a buy. The other team I have getting the buy is Green Bay. Yeah. This is a team that should not have made the playoffs last year. I personally wrote about on my own, uh, wrote about this in great detail, but Detroit certainly, and then Chicago, who had them at home in the final week of the regular season, both really fumbled it. They did. Uh, Green Bay, a team that missed Aaron Rodgers for six games last year, mm -hmm. slides into the playoffs, wins the division at 8-7-1. and one. Yeah. That shouldn't have happened. It's really interesting. In the Football Outsiders Almanac, they talked about that Green Bay is kind of the classic, they have the feel of the non-playoff team from last year that jumps up and gets the bye the next yes. year, only they actually made the playoffs last they did. year. So I've got them 12 and 4 second seed. And then New Orleans, 10 and 6. Again, they jumped from 7 to 11 wins. Remember, they were my big breakout team last year. Mm -hmm. They won't win quite as many this year, although they only do play five games outdoors. That's, that's got to be yeah, that, That's huge, but still, I only say 10 wins. So okay. Seattle and Green Bay, I think, might win a few more than you think, which is why I have them as the top two seeds. New Orleans and San Francisco, certainly double-digit win teams, safely in the playoffs. Those are my top four. We don't differ very much on these. I've got Seattle 12-4, and four, San Francisco 11-5, and five, New Orleans 11-5, and five, Green Bay 11-5, and five, Green Bay getting the second bye, uh, according to my calculation. San Francisco, fun fact here, uh, if they make the playoffs as a wild card, it'll be, you mentioned stadiums before, it'll be the second consecutive year of a team making an NFL wild card right before they host a WrestleMania. In this case, WrestleMania 31 at the new Levi Stadium next year. You didn't know where I was going with that. No, I, actually, I, where I thought you were was the Super Bowl. Oh, okay. <laughs> Being that this was an NFL telecast, an okay. NFL program, yeah, they they will also be hosting the Super Bowl next year. By the way, pick against them next year, San Francisco. Yeah. Well, oh, that's that's a, that's a great point uh, as well. In two years, they got it. Yeah. Or, spoiler alert: Super 2015, the San Francisco 49ers will not make the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. The, the pressure's on them this year to get it in uh, before that. Especially then. because it's kind of an older roster, older than yeah. you think. You know, everyone sort of identifies this as a young team because of Kaepernick, right? But for the most part, there's a lot of veterans on this team. This team is, you know, Seattle's a young team. San yes. Francisco, not so much. Seattle had turned over the entire roster since about, like, 2010. For San Francisco, it's been a slower churn, a little bit longer of a period of time, which is closer to the NFL norm, quite frankly, because well, what Seattle has done, that's another thing that's pretty historic, is getting that kind of a churn and getting that much of a quality replacement over a period of time. That kind of a transfusion generally takes longer. So, again, yeah, you and I don't differ on this. Uh, very much uh, as far as those four teams, and we had covered a lot of this uh, previously. Again, I do want to put over Green Bay in terms of I feel like they really, again, upgraded the defense a lot in the offseason. They're not an elite defense, but all they needed was to not be below average anymore, and I feel like they accomplished that. And, again, it's really going to be uh, very, very fascinating to see how they're going to match up to the other uh, elite teams in the NFC and uh, to, to, to see how that journey goes. Because, like you said, they are going to be playing a first-place schedule, which was unexpected uh, based on how they went last year. We, we talk about it in a theoretical sense, in, especially in baseball, and you see it now in other sports, too, of war wins over replacement value. For Green Bay, we got to see in a very tangible manner last year what that means. Green Bay was a dog crap team without Aaron Rodgers. He yeah, remember back, how bad they, they went, got killed on they Thanksgiving by Detroit? Horrible. They were a horrid team. They were bottom probably eight in the league, I would say, without him. They, Aaron Rodgers comes back. They need to win one game against Chicago to make the playoffs. They do it. Aaron Rodgers, probably the league leader in war based on that. While I don't have the war statistics in front of me, mm -hmm. I can tell you that no player matters more to the line okay. than Aaron Rodgers. Well, that makes sense. It, it's him, Manning, and Brady right at the top which is what you'd think. Yes. So, and we saw that. I mean, Green Bay went from a team who's, you know, mm -hmm. almost always favored when Rodgers in the lineup. They right. won't be in week one against Seattle. Right. But typically they are it, to a team that was an underdog in just about every one of those games without him. Exactly. You know, he plays 16 games. Let's mm -hmm. say he does. Just give him the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. This is a team that the two previous years had won 15 and 11 games. Right. So, that, you know, 15 is obviously a lot to call for. That was when they were coming off the Super Bowl, hitting yes. on all cylinders. You and I loved them that year. They ran into that one of those fluky Giants teams, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But 
you're obviously, to me, looking at a win total between 11 and 15 for this team. They're, they're going to be very good. They also get their two toughest opponents. Um, pardon me, that's New Orleans, I was going to say. Gets their toughest opponents at home, Green Bay and San Francisco. Yeah. Going back to them. So that was just one more thing with New Orleans. The great point yeah. about them as well. Yeah, that, that's going to matter an awful lot. Yeah, and they've won, by the way, another thing with the Saints. They've won 17 in a row at the Superdome when Sean Payton is the head coach. Ooh, okay. Taking away that, you know, the year where the dictator Roger Goodell threw him out of the league. A very consequential uh, statistic. So those are the best four teams in the NFC. We're going to be doing this, like we said, bell curve style, taking the best and the worst in a single segment. So we've gotten those out of the way. We now go to teams that you, Kyle, do not think will make the playoffs. We'll go to the NFC East. We're, we're singling out only one team in there, a team that I have at 8-8 eight and eight as part of the mediocrity clog in the middle there. But uh, you've got them as a definitive will not make the playoffs team, a team that you're generally higher on than I am, the Dallas Cowboys. Cowboys, but their holes this year are a little bit more pronounced because of the offseason that they had, and there seems to be a little bit more gripping than usual going on in Big D, particularly with the recent uh, Jerry Jones uh, <laughs> defending himself media tour. Are you talking about <laughs> gripping? You know? yeah. Is that what we were referring to? Some of yeah. oh, this Jerry Jones looks like he knows how to have a good time, huh? Uh, he does. He does. Great owner. Great owner. <laughs> yeah. Lousy general manager, though. How about them Cowboys? I well, he sucks as an owner because he hired a bad GM, Jerry Jones. <laughs> uh, you know, but that well, you know, I'll tell you what. The worth of that franchise is certainly something. Okay, to be the balance sheet. But I mean, if we're talking, you know, does, doesn't being an owner have anything to do with hiring the right people to get the job done? Maybe it's kind of interesting. If you, if you're hiring <laughs> yourself, I don't know how to. I don't really know how to differentiate the two. I, to me, I think he's a good owner. But a lousy general manager. Okay, that, that's my narrative. Good owner in a business For sense. Jerry. I'll give you that. Yes, yeah. yes, in a business sense. I can agree on that. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll co-sign. But here's the thing: Dallas has gone eight and eight three years in a row. Yes, it has only happened three team, three teams, three times previously since the mm -hmm. NFL went to the sixteen game schedule. Mm -hmm. No team had ever done it four years in a row. So mm -hmm. the where I can see eight and eight's a good projection for them, um, but I to me they're going to finish with a different record. So I'm faced with the choice: Are they going to improve? Or are they going to decline? It's pretty simple. And when I look at this team, I just think decline is the more likely option. Uh, first of all, as I always do when talking about the Dallas Cowboys, I would like to point out that none of this is Tony Romo's fault. Uh, Tony Romo is the only quarterback in the league who could possibly be blamed for losing a 51-48 to game because Lord knows when your team loses 51-48, to it's quarterback fault. They have a very good offensive line, Dallas. He is good at padding his numbers in meaningless games. I don't think he padded him. I saw him go toe-to-toe -to -toe <laughs> with Peyton Manning for three-and-a-half quarters is what I saw in that game. Um has a very good receiver in Des Bryant. DeMarco Murray's pretty good. The offensive line is actually probably top five in the league. But this defense looks really bad. Now, they without, lost not, without DeMarco, where? Yeah, and they lost uh, Sean Lee. Yeah. Like, this was one of the worst defenses in the league last mm -hmm. year, and they lost their best players from that group. Yeah. And by their best players, I mean the only ones that were good. Like, they're going to give up a lot of points this year. And although I do want to defend, uh, I do like to defend Romo because I think he, while not a top five quarterback by any means, he's never been there. I think he's been fringe top 10 for a long time and has been certainly better than most teams' quarterbacks, uh, you know, kind of since taking over this, that starting job. But you got to wonder if his narrative is kind of over at this point. Mm. The idea that Tony Romo is all of a sudden going to take the next step in this, what, this is like his eighth year as a starter? Yeah. That seems a little far fetched. Now he has a suspect back. Yes. You lard that on top of yeah, it. And, and Jason Garrett yeah. is a terrible head coach. I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, he might be a nice guy. I mean, Wade Phillips seemed like a nice guy before him. but Local boy, university school. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. But, you know, again, to your point with Jones, yeah. he doesn't have a good GM himself. Yeah. And he hasn't hired a good coach in a while. Well, here's the thing. Because he likes the lame ducks. I mean, he's got all these guys. Like, Monty Kiffin. He's got Rod Marinelli running around on the defense. Who's leading who? Bill Callahan. Garrett. Who's calling the place? It's just a very bad situation. Well, once in a blue moon, he gets when, when things get bad enough, he gets desperate enough to bring in like a Bill Parcells and let him do stuff, and then that gets old. He wants the credit again, etc. This talk that Jim Harbaugh is going to go there next year. If Jim Harbaugh can't coexist with Trent Balky, how is he going to coexist with Jerry Jones? I don't know, but I'd like to watch. That would be interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no I mean, I mean, that would be unbelievable. Yeah. Can you imagine if Jerry Jones walked onto the sideline and started? like telling people what to do on Jim Harbaugh's sideline, Jim Harbaugh might attempt to kill him. We would see something with only one precedent in the history of the league. And I, I was reading a, a biography the one time that indicated... Kevin that, Gilbride, Buddy Ryan? No, uh, I'll go further than that. Robert Ursay once fired a coach in the middle of the game. He, he was, of course, drunk. He was completely this, this was during, drunk off his ass. Okay, this was this, in the 70s. Oh, was this like the... This is when Baltimore really kind of hit its yeah. deer right before they moved? Uh, this was like mid-70s. They were oh, still relevant. Oh. I, I, I don't... I'm, 
Did he, did he fire Ted March of Rota or did he promote Ted March of Rota? I don't remember the specifics. Robert Ursay once fired a coach in the middle of the game. Okay, You'll see that yeah, because I, I, Harbaugh <laughs> will tell him off and Jerry Jones will give him the you know slitting throat gesture and Harbaugh will be carried off the sidelines in the middle of the game. A couple quick notes on Dallas. Yeah. Of those three previous teams mm-hmm. uh, that had finished 8-8 eight eight three straight years, Okay. Um, one – 99 Titans mm-hmm. uh, went to the Super Bowl, lost wow. on the famous play uh, to St. Louis, which okay. stopped one yard short. Uh, the other two uh, did not do very well. Uh, they fell to a combined 6 20 and 1. One of those, there was a strike shortened season in there. Okay. Uh, there was an eight, a team from 83 okay. in there. I can't remember who it was. Off, I don't have which team. I think it might have been Green Bay. You can check on that. I think it's a Paul Sider's Almanac, quite frankly. Not to reference that for the <laughs> second time in five minutes, but I will. Um, and then the other thing. Betting alert. Listen to this. Mm-hmm. You're going to love this, Rick Morris. Mm-hmm. When favored under Jason Garrett, mm-hmm. the Dallas Cowboys are 9-21 and 1 against the spread. Wow. That's horrible. Okay. As a dog, they're 16-7. and seven. Interesting. Keep that in mind. Yeah, so, I mean, basically, this is a team that gets to the Mendoza line yeah. in the most unconventional of ways. Usually, right. you know, you see a team, they beat all the bad teams, lose to all the good teams. Right. Dallas just does it such a bass backwards way. Right. Uh, that you know, but, well, but the, there'll be a decline this year. With that, de- okay. that defense is too bad. And I, I was just talking about the '70s Colts a second ago here. Dallas, a big powerhouse of the '70s. The next team we're going to get to in the NFC North, another '70s powerhouse, the Minnesota Vikings. They were in uh, the midst of a run where they would make the Super Bowl four times, Lose losing them all. all of them. Uh, Bud Grant uh, manning the sidelines for uh, for those Super Bowls. I got them at six and ten this year. To me, they were just about the easiest ones to put on this list. Uh, unlike Dallas. Dallas, where I kind of quibble a little bit about how bad they're going to be. I don't really quibble in the case of Minnesota. Now, again, I, I six and ten to me is not the mark of a horrible team. You're, you're below Especially average. Especially because that'd be one more win than they had last year. And yeah, I'd, I'm the kind of guy that sees a, a, a decent difference between five and eleven and six and ten. Certainly more than f- four and twelve and five and eleven. I think when you get to six wins, you're starting to you're you're on you're within eyesight of respectability, and that's exactly yeah, what I would one call or two Minnesota. Go, games go the other way you're You're, 500 you're not in respectability but you can see it from here and that's how i see minnesota uh, I think that Zimmer is going to do a nice job of firing these guys up, getting the most out of them. The quarterback situation, one way or another. That's got to play its way out. That, yeah. That's the big thing here. Minnesota, to me, they're, you really can't evaluate this team until Bridgewater's in there and we see him in real live regular season games. Right. You know, Matt Castle, very clearly a placeholder. The Christian Ponder here has obviously come and gone at this right. point. I mean, at this time last year, though, if you recall, Ricky, you and I were both predicting, you know, some doom for Minnesota. Yeah. Doom in the sense that we both saw through that mirage that was the 10 and 6 season two years ago. Right. This was a very clear candidate to regress last yeah. year, and regress they did. But the good news is for Minnesota, when you regress like that, there's kind of an uptick. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the old plexiglass principle. Right. You know, when you when you have a big drop like that from year to year, you're probably going to go up a little bit. Now, this mm-hmm. division is pretty hard. Right. I, I think the NFC North is the second best division in football behind the West. So. Yeah, six wins is what the odds makers are calling for here, and it's it's what I'm saying too. Okay. To me, Zimmer's gonna make the defense better because that defense was terrible. Mm-hmm. But it, it's all about waiting for Bridgewater, and this is a two-year plan. This yes. is a team that let's see how Bridgewater does this year. They could be better next year. I think definitely uh, that will be the case. They're gonna continue to make progressions uh, back towards our respectability in the South. We got one team that makes your list. Uh, I got them at seven and nine. You've got them at worse than that. The Carolina Panthers. We both pick them to regress sort of similar to what we were saying about minnesota the team that made that spike uh the year before to make the playoffs that's going to fall back you have the fall being more drastic than mine yeah usually when it's funny that i think people look at carolina winning 12 games last year they look at what's still one of the preeminent front sevens it's in the very league. very good front seven and they say okay you can yeah we all know they're gonna be worse but hey full of a team i mean okay seven seem you know that's a big drop off i'm telling you that the drop-off can be pretty bad. We saw it with Atlanta and Houston. Mm-hmm. It can be a lot more severe than you think. Everything went right for Carolina okay. last year. Yeah. And you look at it, they're weak on the offensive line with the retirement of Gross. Mm-hmm. The receivers are one of the two worst in the league, along with Cleveland. The secondary stinks. They were really lucky in close games. Finally, now that's after two years of being very unlucky in close games with Cam Newton and Ron Rivera. But they were lucky in close games last year. Newton's not healthy. Right. I mean, is there? There's no positive way to spin the Panthers off season. Somebody has to have a bad record in this conference. Right. Because I'm not picking anyone to go four and twelve. So I'm picking the team to finish with the worst record in the NFC to be a team that had the second best last year, Carolina. 
Well, and again, they were a team that with Steve Smith, and particularly, again, you have to define the receiving core these days as going beyond one and two. You have to go down to Correct. really about one to about four for every team. Even with Steve Smith, one of the worst receiving cores in the league. No Steve Smith this year, and again, I, I just think that it, it's unrealistic to think you know, that that passing game is not going to regress I don't think Steve Smith would have actually helped that much. I don't totally disagree. Would have been a little stability. It would have been. It would have been. I mean, it, you know, it certainly doesn't make him better getting rid of him. Mm-hmm. But you know, we'll talk when we talk about Baltimore. I'll yeah. mention more. I, I thought he was an overrated pickup. Quite frankly, thirty-five okay. years old. I mean, what's a thirty-five-year-old receiver? Yeah. Do? But I, I just think it all goes wrong, and Ron Rivera might get fired at the end of this year. He might. He might. It, it, and the same thing happened to Leslie Frazier. Is that you jack up expectations yes. at a point in your tenure when it's inconvenient, and it happened now. Here's the thing, too. I mean, I go back in time, and I mean, that happened in Cleveland. It happened to Romeo Cornell 2007, 2008. Now, it deserved to happen to Romeo because he wasn't a very good head coach, but swept out in that tide, unfairly cast out of Cleveland for the first of two different times was Rod Chazinski in the whole thing here. Uh, good old uh, Chud got swept out uh, here. So oh, He wasn't very good anyway. <laughs> I'm just, I'm partially trolling you on that, partially because I believe it, but no, that's it. Rob Chazinski, also a Carolina connection here, uh, previous offensive yeah. coordinator. Yeah, we saw how well we saw how much Carolina's offense fell off without him, huh? <laughs> well, I got nothing for that one. But, yeah, I think that, again, if, if, that would probably be unfair if Ron Rivera gets cast out because of a bad season this year. It doesn't mean that well, you throw out the, the baby with the fair. The F ain't for fair in NFL, buddy. Well, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. I guess I'm not just talking about fair. I'm also talking about smart because what have we talked about with Cleveland? You keep hitting the reset button all the time. Do you want to hit the reset button in Carolina just because the team can't live up to what are you and I agree I are unrealistic see, expectations yes, this year? Yes, but I don't think Ron Revere is a great coach, though, I'll be honest with you. I think he got lucky last year. He progressed last year. It seemed like did he, he did. You know, I thought the the whole Riverboat Ron thing He changed was, on the fly. How many coaches have the, the intelligence to do that? I guess I'll give him credit, but I'll give him credit in the sense that he stopped being dumb. Okay. Like, you know, like, he, he basically did what he should have done. He, he wasn't is he wasn't risky. Okay. No, the, 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 he, he earned this mantra that he was making these risky decisions. He wasn't. He mm-hmm. was playing percentages. Right. When you have a huge quarterback like Cam Newton, go for it. Right. That's true. That's absolutely true. And that you should do that and that he needs to do that uh, a little bit more. So we put Carolina on our ugly pile here and we go to the Western Division. We will have covered the entire NFC West in this segment. We did it with our really good teams, Seattle and San Francisco. We do that with the other two teams in the division joining the old uh, bottom end of the spectrum here. Arizona, who I have at 7-9 and nine and not being a very bad team. St. Louis at 5-11, and 11, who I will admit post Sam Bradford, I think will have a bad record. I'm putting them down for the worst record in the NFC at this point. So I sort of conditionally agree with you on both of these. And if, if the standard is teams that we can rule out making the playoffs, yeah, because as much as what you said previously, I laughed until somebody actually said it to me. Hey, Arizona might be the sleeper in the NFC this year. No. You do not go from missing the playoffs at 10 and 6 to making the playoffs the next year. Go ask the aforementioned 07 Cleveland Browns about the odds of pulling that off. Yeah, especially when you only won five games the year before. Again, plexiglass yeah. principle. They were, gonna, they were lucky to get to 10 wins with Carson Palmer as their quarterback. Larry Fitzgerald, by the way, kind of in decline. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Hopefully, Bruce Arians uses Andre Ellington a little bit more out of the backfield this year. He's supposed to. Not now that Richard Mendenhall, his former boy in Pittsburgh, is gone. He has really yeah. no excuse not to. The offensive line's work in progress. I think the front seven is going to regress. Secondary is very good. I just look at Arizona as a team that, you know, if you're viewing them as a stock, mm-hmm. I think 10 wins was kind of their 52-week high in a way, you know, I guess to make a, a lame comparison. I just don't think that they – people like – Oh man, they won ten games last year. That makes them a sleeper. No, it just makes mean that they were really, really unlucky. Yeah, you know that that was kind of their year. You know, we talked about how Green Bay was lucky to get in yeah. the playoffs. Arizona was just very unfortunate. They missed their window. That they play in a division that has two very good teams. Yeah, they're still going to have two very good teams. Mm-hmm. And so they're they're not going to win as many games this year. I, they're one of my favorite future bets. I under seven and a half. Yeah, favorite future bets. St. Louis. I actually think St. Louis finishes above Arizona. Wow. And our big difference is you and I have talked off air, and mm-hmm. we know this, and probably most people who've listened to all the past episodes. Of this, I just have 
very little affinity for Sam Bradford. Okay. So his injury did not really mean much in my projection for them. I okay. still have them at seven and nine. Okay. Above Arizona at six and ten. And our uh, our good friend uh, Joe Linway, of course, uh, proclaiming recently on Facebook that uh, Jeff Fisher is the best head coach in the league, and a man who coaches the game the right way, uh, in, in Joe's inestimable opinion. But uh, I think I blo- <laughs> I think I blocked him. <laughs> Not Jeff Fisher. <laughs> no, no, exactly. I don't think Bernie Kosar would agree with uh, Joe Linway on that either. By the way, after his yeah. classless comments. I mean, yeah. I mean, the thing is, people are like, oh, well, three, you know, three teams made the playoffs in, a div- in one division last year, the mm-hmm. AFC West. That's rare. It doesn't happen. It happens maybe once every other year. Yeah. It's tough to happen. So with St. Louis and Arizona are just screwed being in the same division as Seattle and San Francisco. And sometimes it's as simple as this. Quarterback. Yeah. You got Russell Wilson and Colin Kaepernick. Yep. With two great defenses. Mm -hmm. The Rams and Cardinals have two very good defenses, but they got Sean Hill and Carson Palmer. There's your gap right there. Yeah. Uh, exactly. That that explains an awful lot of it. Uh, so going back to the best teams that we were talking about here, uh, again, lining up uh, Seattle as the best team in the NFL, which they are presently in both your power rankings and mine. My overall prediction for the season, Seattle over New England in the Super Bowl. How about yours? I'm waiting to give that. Okay. Do I have to give that right here? Uh, you don't have to right here. Okay. I'm going to give that later. Okay. That one. I'm going to give it. We'll, 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 you got yours? Okay. We're going to tease the listeners. I'll give it one of the AFC ones. Okay. All right, we will do that. Look forward to that then. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all clear channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, GoBoard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Out. Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 